before we begin, I've got some literature which I'd like people to consider having a read of. And they're related to the King James Version, of the, the accuracy of the King James Version, at least in the context of these, the arguments that are made in these books. But, um, you know, I'll, I'll leave them in a the church, but they, they, they cover a lot of, lot of topics because... As we've covered over the last couple of weeks, if the Bible's the Word of God, it's important how accurately it's translated. And you've got books here on the New King James Version, the ecumenical movement within, within translations, and, and all these different things. And, you know, I'm not King James only, but I affirm that the King James Version is an excellent translation, although it's, you know, we've, got, we've got issues with Old English. But nevertheless, I'll leave them. Um, I'd like you to read them because it's important you know if this is the Bible it's important to understand it it's important to know it and it's important to know what the original author said so with that in mind turn with me if you will to Hebrews chapter 4 Hebrews chapter 4 Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left of us, entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall not enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief, again he limiteth a certain day in David, saying, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you hear his voice, Harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, he would not afterwards have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest for the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Over the, the series here, we've covered from chapter 1. It's important to keep the theme in mind of this book, because this is probably the most complicated book in the New Testament, if not the entire Bible. It has a, a theme running through it. It's no ordinary book. And in the beginning, he begins with God, which Genesis began in the beginning, and that, that's where everything starts. It started with God, and that's what the whole Bible starts with. He begins with the definition of who God is and refers to him as the God who spoke to the Hebrews, the Jewish people, in the ancient times through the prophets and to the fathers. And then in these last days, plural, last days, that is the time from when Jesus came onto earth to the end of the world, last days. We're in that now. They were in it during the crucifixion. That God has spoken through him. And then he goes on to say, he is the brightness and the express image of the glory of God. Equating him and putting him equal with God. And he is the one who upholds all things by the word of his power. We get a central theme here of the word of his power. And then he himself, this person, 
purged our sins. This person is the one who died in our place. We believe in substitutionary atonement. I do. Substitutionary atonement means he took our place and that he died specifically for sin. And then when he did this, he gave signs and he gave wonders and then he ascended up to heaven. We're going to cover a little bit of that as well later. And, and then he sat down with the majesty on high, made so much better than the angels because he obtained a more excellent name than they. Angels played an important part in the Jewish thinking and they played an important part in creation according to them. And here he's saying he's the one who created. So he's higher than they are. And then he talks about how Jesus is higher than the angels because angels worship him. He doesn't worship them. So he's not one of them. He is a completely separate being to that. And he loves righteousness, hates iniquity and so on. And then he calls his people brethren. It's very important to note that. And he sat down at the majesty, at the right hand of the majesty on high, and he waits there until all of the enemies of God are under his footstool. Of which he said, Sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies my, thy footstool. And then he talks, in chapter 2, he moves on and talks about how, because of who Jesus is, the importance of the word importance of what he spoke, we have to give earnest attention to all the things that he spoke because of the danger that we will let them slip. And the danger still continues on today. It, continued on. it was like there for the Jewish people back in the beginning. The danger of letting this, this, this gold slip away. And it slipped through your fingers because sin is so strong. Original sin is so strong. And this word was spoken, and, um, and, then he, and then he talks about how there's a, a recompense of reward for those who, who disobey, that if you disobey Jesus and don't follow Jesus, there's no other way. No other way. People in the Old Testament times, some of them were ignorant because Jesus hadn't yet come in the flesh. So when he comes, that's it. There's no more, there's no more offering going to happen. There's no more offering going to happen of salvation for anyone till the end of the world, that's it. Jesus is the final offering. If you neglect that and don't believe, there's no hope. There's only two ways you can go. That's your destiny, hell or heaven. There's only two ways. And these things are determined before the foundations of the world were laid. So and then all of this makes Christ preeminent, which preeminent means he's more important than. So he moves on, he's more important than Moses. He's more important than the law, even. To the Jewish people, that's... that's uh, a big, big statement to make. And then he talks about us being brethren, the people, the believers, who are with Jesus Christ, one with him. They are reconciled before God. And then he talks, chapter 3, the superiority of Jesus Christ over Moses. And then he talks about how Jesus, when he was doing this, was building a house. He's been building the house from the very beginning. That's what the Garden of Eden was all about. A house has a garden. And he put Adam in that garden to look after the garden like a father would and say to his children, just look after the garden, but just don't touch that. But like children, we can't do it. You tell children to not look after, you know, don't go near that, that's the one thing they're going to go for. And we're the same. And then in chapter 4 he talks about the heavenly rest of those and how previously he had mentioned that because of unbelief that's the one thing that's going to prevent anybody from entering in. But then he talks about this eternal rest which is promised us, which we all, we all need. And that is typed in the seventh day of creation when God rested from all, all of his works. Them things show us that the law was there right at the very beginning. The Sabbath was already instituted right at the very beginning of creation. God rested on the seventh day. And he continues on, and then he moves up to this verse where we've covered over the last couple of weeks about the Word of God being quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And that, I argue, is the person of Jesus Christ, of whom the Scriptures are the breath of. Because if he's God, God is inseparable, then the scriptures are by inspiration of God, therefore it is the word of Jesus Christ, right? There isn't any other way of looking at it. 
and there's no creature that's not manifest in his sight. So today we're continuing on with that same theme. Keep all of that theme in mind. So if we can turn to 12 by way of reminder, verse 12 of chapter 4 by way of reminder. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. We've covered how the Bible is so important for the believer. That if that is referring to Jesus Christ and the word of God, as in the Bible... The Bible is absolutely important, as is our relationship with Jesus. So if we're one with him, we should be one with scripture. Really, if we're true Christians, really, we should be teaching by the Holy Spirit the same things that the scriptures teach. There shouldn't really, if we are truly in the spirit, there shouldn't be really so much conflict within the church about differences of doctrines. If we're one in Christ, and we're one in the Holy Spirit, there's not two spirits, is there? Something's wrong with so much conflict within the Christian church. Something's disastrous, disastrously wrong with this oneness. If we're one with the Lord, then we're one in the scriptures. So when he talks about this dividing asunder of the soul and spirit, this is what the word of God does. I've described that it's like a powerful two-edged sword. It's not a sword that has one sharp edge. And it pierces and that takes the heart of a man. And when you take something that pierces someone with a sword, there's no hope of survival. You've got to be raised from the dead. Because you are dead. When it pierces the soul and the spirit, the soul is the very life of the person. That this word of God has taken and it's been thrust right through a man. It's not just slashed him. You can see a sword fight between two people and they're hitting each other with them and a hand might come off or... They might take the butt end of the sword and crack somebody on the head with it and fight like that. So this, there might be survivors, not with this. This is stating that there's no survivors because it's pierced the very soul and spirit and cut the man up. And that's why it's double-edged, because it goes in and cuts up and cuts down and it divides the person in two. It's very violent language. Very violent language, but it's making a very, very important point and then the joints and the marrow. And is the discerner of the thoughts and intents. The joints and the marrow is what's going to be visible when this person, this being, is cut up. And he isn't speaking literal here. Not in this sense. He's not speaking literal. He's using, um, you remember um, the, the term which I used where the Holy Spirit has the habit of using symbolic language and descriptive language. Then... He's talking here about a specific point, and I want you to try and get this. I want you to try and get this, because it's very, very important when we come to the next verse. To just cover a little bit more about this discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, because we covered the other bits of the verse, I want to cover, if you can, if you can focus in your minds, to the discerner and thoughts and intents of the heart. Just if you can kind of keep focused on that. This discerner, is not something that we think today. You know, you think today, oh, oh you have discernment, a gift of discernment. And it's, it's right away through the church. People think, you know, they've got a, a gift of discernment, discerning of spirits and so on. This, this is not what it's talking about here. This is from the Greek word kritikos. It means to be critical. So, here, and I want to make the point here, because when we see that word critical, us as humans, you, you automatically have a picture in your mind. Words display pictures, don't they? We all see words and we all interpret that word to mean what it means according to our, maybe even our own experiences. So the word critical is not the same as what you'd think from people. People are critical. Some people are just critical all the time. They criticise everything. Right? They criticise things that don't belong to them. They criticise things that do belong to them. Or they criticise people because they're not doing what they want them to do. Or they're not behaving the way they want them to do. So the critic, and some people just criticise all the time. Don't like this. Don't like that. I'm not happy with anything. If you don't find one thing critical. You've got to find another thing critical. You just got to find something to criticise. Now, that's some people are like that. I'm critical of doctrine. I confess it. But I'm critical of doctrine for a particular reason, because it's my salvation that's on the line here. 
you know, if I've got to believe something, then I've got to know that that is true. Because if I'm going to base my trust and faith on something, it's, it's got to be accurate. So I've got to be critical. So criticism isn't always a bad thing, it's a good thing. But criticising something that doesn't, you don't own is, is incorrect. You have no rights to criticise it. I don't own this building, I can't walk into it and start just tearing it to bits and saying I don't like the doors or I don't like the seats or whatever, or I don't like the, the, the roof. I can't do that, it's not my building. But I can go into my own home and tear it to bits and rebuild it because it's mine. Jesus owns us. He owns his people. We're not our own. He has the right to criticise us. He has the right. He owns his church. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20. 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Verse 20, for you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. That's ownership. You are owned by him. He's bought you. He's bought you like somebody bought a slave and they own him. And then he sets you free. You are not your own. He has the right to criticize you and tear you to bits and say, this is wrong, that is wrong, that is wrong, that is wrong. That's got to go. And you know what? You know what? You know what this verse is telling us when he talks about the joints and the marrow and the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. A critic. A critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. There is not one part of you that he cannot get to. Do you know that? There's no hidden part within your body or within your soul or within your spirit that he does not have access to. If he owns you, he can, you know, every single bit about you. There's nothing that, he, that you can hide away from him. Every single bit of you, he has access to. That's why he's describing the joints and the marrow. He knows every single thing about you, even down to your thoughts. Every thought you have, every intent of the heart, every reason you do things and you can think them and escape from God. I'm going to take my thoughts and I'm going to have them, they're mine. And I'm going to escape away from God and he's not going to get to them. He can't do that. He can't do that. He knows everything about you. But he also, he doesn't just have the knowledge of everything within you in order to criticise you and tear you to pieces and pull you apart. He has the ability to change those things that he does not find acceptable. To get to those parts and change them. Just like a surgeon says, this isn't right. This is infected, this is wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. He has the power to cut you up and operate on you and get within you and get the badness out. He has that power and mark my words, sin is not just a spiritual thing. Original sin has got into every single inch of your DNA. It's in everything about you. The depth of original sin began at the moment of conception and it continues on to when a baby is born, still in sin, still in original sin, till the day you die. But when you're in Christ Jesus, when he has purchased you, we await the final day of the resurrection when we die. When we die, we've been completely free from sin. So when you think about this critic of the thoughts, well here the, the, the thoughts is described in the Greek New Testament to be the devices of men. So in other words, that men have ways and devices of working things through and thinking things through and, and, and you, you know, you, you can think of, you know, like, let's, let's use examples where we think of people who have political power. <laughs> And they appear like angel, angelic beings on the, on the surface of it. They appear like they're good people. They appear to be changing things. But he knows what's going on. He knows their true intentions of what they are truly planning. 
And when he reveals that, he can reveal the, the goats from the sheep, he can reveal the false people within the church, and he can reveal the true people within the church, the intents of the heart and the thoughts. If you imagine, I want you to imagine, if all your thoughts could be seen now, all the thoughts that you've had, both good and bad, could be seen and publicly displayed in front of all of us now. Can you imagine that? Where would you be? It's a frightening thought even just thinking about it. Right? If they, Bob Dylan wrote, if, they, if, they, if my thought dreams could be seen, they'd put my head in the guillotine. And that's true. It's true of humanity. We are ut- utterly corrupt. We are utterly depraved. And mark my words, it's not only the thoughts that, that make us evil. Thoughts don't make us evil. Thoughts are a product of our depravity. We are not good. We are rotten to the core. It's our thoughts are only the product. You, you take this, take this symbolism. Take this symbolism. If you have a vineyard, and in that vineyard you have trees planted, trees. One tree doesn't bring up good fruit. Another, another tree brings good fruit. Does the fruit that is on, the good, on that tree make that tree good? Or is the fruit a product of the tree being good already? Do you get my point? It's not a reversal. In other words, your good works don't make you good. It's a reversal of that. They're a product of our salvation. That's what they're a product of. They don't come from us. Because our thoughts and intents of the heart are corrupt. Evil, continuously. Why? Because it's all self-centred. It all goes back to the sin of Adam. It's just utterly corrupt. When you think about that, these are are moral characteristics. And the intents, when he says that word intents, the thoughts and intents, that's the intentions. These are moral characteristics in the Greek. He knows them, and he discerns them, he's a critic of them, of the heart, the thoughts and intents of the heart. This, in the Greek, is a cardia. It's probably where we get the word cardiac from. So it relates to the heart. But in the Latin, it's, it's core. It's the core of a man. The, the heart in Scripture is... Speaking in a figurative way related to everything, the effective centre of our very being, of who we are physically, we know that the heart, once the heart stops, that's it, your life's over. And we likewise know that the heart itself contradicts the theory of evolution, because the theory of evolution, when did the heart evolve and when did the blood begin? Where did the blood come from in the first place? Answer me that. No one can answer that. Where did, where did blood come from? When did the heart suddenly start to pump when the baby was in the womb and pump the blood around to give life to the flesh? It's the very heart of our being. This is the very effective centre of our very being. This is where everything comes from. Because this is the one that gives life. It spreads around your entire body. And the intents of the heart, that's what it's describing. The very person of who you are is the organ of the human body that is the centre of the circulation of our blood. It's just not only that, because, it, because of what it gives us life, it also goes to the spiritual, physical life. It's the central seat of where life sits. It's the fountain that flows through the mind and the soul where the thoughts are seated, the desires, the emotions, the passions, the intelligence, the human will and the correct character. It's where it all stems from. The heart is quite possibly the very central, um, the very central organ of our, of our very being, and he knows it. He knows every single. But humans have to do tests to find stuff out. Humans have to do that. They have to take samples and so on, test your blood, test this, that, to find out what's going on. He just knows like that. He just knows instantly. You don't have to wait for a diagnosis for six months. Or you don't have to wait for this operate. He knows instantly. Doesn't that give you an insight when Jesus Christ healed people? When 
He healed diseases and knew what was wrong with people. Have you ever thought of that? People came up and said, oh, I've got, th- 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 someone had this disease or that disease or this illness. How did they know? How did they know it was accurate? How did they know it was the right diagnosis? He knew, without them even showing him what the disease was, he knew and he healed it. Because the word of God goes right the way through the body. Right the way through the soul, the spirit. And the power of his word. Look at, look at Jeremiah 23, 29. Jeremiah 23, 29. This is the description of his word. The power of his word. Is not my word like a hammer that breaks a rock into pieces? Jeremiah 23, 29. Is not my word like a hammer that breaks a rock into pieces? Here we've got that violent, strong language again. That a rock can be smashed into pieces by the power of his word. All the insides, all of it insides, and things never seen before by man. He can break it up. Jesus, the word of God, knows what's going on. That is a reality. He knows what's going on. Look at this. John 5, 42. John 5, 42. This is what Jesus said to the Pharisees. John 5, 42. But I know you, that ye have not the love of God in you. How can a person make such a claim to a so-called righteous people, a religious folk who are doing so-called the works of God day after day after day? They were the holy people. They were the priests who you may visit at, at a cathedral or anywhere, a Roman Catholic church, whatever you want to visit, any religious organisation, and you see the so-called holy, frozen chosen walking down with their uniforms on, with their altars and with their staffs and with their gold and silver to make them look important. And those are the people who in the New Testament were the same. They were the top scholars. They were the top priests. They were the archbishops. They were the ones, the very ones who were objecting to the true word of God, the true movement that God was doing. And he said to them, but I know you. You have not the love of God in you. What a statement. There's only two ways of looking at it. Either he's wrong or he's right. If he was right, where did he get that knowledge from? If the word of God has the power to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart gets into every single bit of a human being and has that power. That's no ordinary person. Now when you look, and you look further on to this, turn to verse 13 of of Hebrews 4, we continue on. The thoughts and intents of the heart, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. That's very important to note that when he says, It's not manifest from his sight. This is to show the person behind the word. Logos, theos. These are the two Greek words which are used to describe word of God. Logos, theos. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. Now here, remember when I mentioned about translation things, that this word neither, you've got two two words here in in the Greek which are not translated in the King James, and you've got kai, a Greek word kai, if you make note of that, K-A-I, kai. It's a Greek word, and it's always translated and, essentially, but for some reason the King James verse, uh, I'll put this in. It's a discern of the thoughts and intents of the heart, and neither is any creature not manifest in his sight. Kai should be there, really. And I think it's important, because it's continuing on. It shouldn't be a full, full stop there. I don't think the translators have done, uh, done us any favours by putting a full stop there. It should continue on. Is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, and neither is any creature not manifest in his sight. But it doesn't give a wrong interpretation because of the result of that, but nevertheless it's worth noting. But neither is, is, a, is a good. It's a good translation because it communicates the two words. But it incorporates these two words, and if you will, neither. It doesn't necessarily point to the idea that anything can be hidden from God. It points to the idea that Nothing is hidden from him. 
Nothing is hidden from God. All people, this is, this is what he's talking about, neither is any creature. This is the entire creation, whether they are saved or unsaved, have got this within them. Nothing is hidden from him. Neither is there any creature not manifest in his sight. And there's a reason why he uses the word creature there in the translation, and I'll get to that in a minute. It points to the idea that nothing is hidden from God. All people everywhere, regardless of whether they're Jew, Gentile, black man, white, whatever race, whatever time, whatever era of creation they have been from until the end of the world, nothing is hidden from him. All at the same time, seven billion people on the planet, and not one of them are hidden from him. The thoughts and intents, everything about them, all at the same time. What kind of miraculous being is this? What God is this? You've got to ask that question. What intelligence, what power does he have? This is, not only does this God do miraculous things, he is miraculous in himself. You can't imagine how anybody, I, I used to think as a child, how did he hear all the prayers at the same time? How does he manage that? Why, why should I bother him when I can do it myself? You know, I don't need to ask him to do stuff, I can do it myself. But how can he hear this? How can he hear that at the same time, all the time? Every minute, each... I have no theological answer for it. I can't come up with anything for it. It's who God is. That is God. This is who he is. Nothing is hidden from him. The whole of creation is all made manifest before him and it's naked before him. And there's a reason why he says that. It's quite frightening. It's quite frightening that it's not only is it naked in a reference to nudity, it's a nakedness in the everything about you. Nothing is hidden. You really think about this, you think, we've all sinned last week. Every one of us has sinned last week. We know at this very moment what those sins are. I know what my sins are. You know what your sins are. None of us have not sinned. We've all sinned this past week, and he knows. That is the reality, he knows. Even though he's covered that sin. Even though for those who believe, it's covered. The sin has been atoned for, and our sins have been washed. He still knows them. Because nothing is not manifest in his sight. The word of God discerns everything about the person. In his sight, literally, this is beautiful. This is where he gets to the, the beauty part of it. It's not manifest in his sight. It literally means it's in the presence of God. I mean, that's beautiful in one sense, but it's bad in another. That the evil intents and thoughts of the heart, which are bad, are in his presence. Now that's... That's... I, I, the more I get to this, the more I see why so many saints of the ancient church would, would rather just kill themselves or just rather jump into a lake than sin against God, knowing that if our sins are really in his presence, then I'm frightened of even exploring this right this very minute. I don't want to explore it. Because I'm going to receive a great judgment. That's the thing. It's frightening. It's in his sight. It's in his presence. And all here means all. Make no mistake about it. It doesn't only mean the chosen. It doesn't only mean believers. It means all of creation. is manifest in his sight. And, and even more than this, the f more frightening things than this, when he says, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked. That's not just a reference to, to being actually without clothes in front of him. This is something that yeah, has the meaning of being seized. Of being seized by him. Captured. Taken by him. Grabbed by the throat. And ripped open. Right down to the gullet. That's what it means. Now you might think, oh, well, that's, that's a bit extreme, Simon, right? This is talking here in the context of what the high priest used to do to the sacrifice. When the high priest used to take the sacrifice, he took it by the throat, slashed it, cut it open. That's what he means by open, naked. The animal, the creature was naked before him. It had to be inspected. 
It had to be perfect. You remember how I've said that, that we as people are to consume the Word of God. We're not only to read it, we're to consume it to let it go right within us. Into every part of us. Why? It's important to do that because, because God is, is there. He's all at the intents of our heart are right before Him. We consume the Word of God. We let it in because we are living sacrifices to God. That's, that's a, a, a frightful reality of what Scripture says. Present your body as living sacrifices to God, which we'll get to in a minute. But here, this is what he's talking about. Before this high priest, before this person, nothing is hidden from him. The blemishes, the perfections, the sides of us, the things. And he grabs it by the throat and it's opened. That's what the open means. He takes it by the throat and he tears it down the middle and he tears it open and he inspects every inch of you. That's what he does in the spiritual. He's not talking literal, so, you know, we're not talking um, uh, anything radically extreme here, all right? Make that disclaimer. He's not going to tear you by the throat. He's not going to come here and grab you by the throat and tear you up. So don't get any nightmares or, or frightening thoughts or anything. God is on our side. All right? But the inspection is so thorough that the language used here is violent to describe it and to show you the fear that you should have of God. You should have a healthy fear of Him. So He's been taken here, naked, inspected and cut open to see if the creature is acceptable to the high priest or not. Because that, when we have our sins atoned for us, and when Jesus applies that atonement to us, and he makes us perfect before him, that is how he sees us. He sees us like that animal sacrifice which was made. He takes it, and he checks it for blemishes, because that is what the high priest would... And later on in the series, we're going to cover more of that, of exactly the work that this high priest did to the animal which was sacrificed, because that's the way things were before Christ came. That's how God, God um, de designed it. The being is then divided into two parts. This is, this is part of what they did to the animal. You know when you take the animal sacrifice into Jerusalem, take it to the temple, the high priest would take the being and divide it into two parts. The joints and marrow were all visible in all the inner, inner parts of the animal. And during the daily sacrifice, the lamb was slain, the priest hung it up by the, by the foot. Mark this when you think of Jesus Christ having the nails put through his foot and being hung upon a cross. Mark this, because the high priest took the sacrifice and he hung it up by the foot and he skinned it. He skinned it. He took the skin and tore it right off. And then when it came to the, to the, to the breast, he tore it open and he cut the head off and he, having finished skinning of it, he divided the heart and he took out the blood and he cut off the shoulders. And when it came to the right leg, he cut it off. And then he cut it down, right through the bone. Everything was manifest to that high priest. Now when you think of that, doesn't that mean something more when you think of what Paul said? Present your bodies as living sacrifices to God. Mm. Really? And you know, this, this, this sacrifice which was originally given, which, which God ordained, uh, does anybody know anything know about the red heifer? The red heifer, this was, this was an ancient creature. I say that particularly, this... There's no red heifers today. That's why I completely disagree. Unless, somebody, unless God miraculously um, recreates a red heifer, there is no red heifer. The, the temple system, they claim, some theological, um, theologians and ministers claim that the temple in Jerusalem is going to be rebuilt and then they're going to continue on in sacrifices. But unless a red heifer is born, even the Jews know this, it's impossible for it to happen. They thought a couple of them have come along. And you know, and the, the beauty is, after Christ was crucified, there was no more red heifers. They went out of creation. And I'm not talking myth here, I'm talking fact. Check it up, it's historical fact. There is no red heifer, because this red heifer had to be a pure red heifer. If there was one strand of hair on the heifer, it wasn't suitable, it wasn't, it wasn't right, it was imperfect. And a while back, they, that a, a red heifer was born, and they thought, oh, that's it, the end of times is here, this is it. It was sparking off the end of days. 
the temple is going to be rebuilt, we've got a red heifer. And then all of a sudden, a little white patch appeared on the tail. No red heifer. Now if you think about that, and you look at, look at Numbers, Numbers 19, 1 to 10. Numbers 19, 1 to 10. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron. This is important to talk about Aaron because in these verses he's, he, he's stating that Jesus was more important or more superior than Aaron. Uh, verse 2. This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord hath commanded, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring, out, they bring thee a red heifer without spot, wherein there is no blemish, and upon which never came a yoke. You see that? That this, this red heifer had to come about and had to be perfect with not a single blemish on it. Not even a yoke being put upon it. Absolutely perfect. Verse 3, And ye shall give her unto Eleazar the priest that he may bring her forth without the camp, that's outside the camp, and one shall slay her before his face, that this sacrifice had to be taken outside of the camp, which Jesus was. And the priest shall take her blood with his finger and sprinkle her blood directly before the tabernacle and the congregation seven times. And one shall burn the heifer in his sight, her skin, and her flesh, and her blood, and her dung, he shall burn. And the priest shall take the cedar wood, and hyssop, and scarlet, and cast it in the midst of the burning of the heifer. Then the priest shall wash his clothes, and he shall bathe his flesh in water, and afterwards he shall come into the camp, and the priest shall be unclean for the, for the evening, and so on. We don't need to read it all. But essentially the point is here that the red heifer had to be according to the law. There is no red heifer anymore. There can be no temple rebuild without a red heifer. So unless God miraculously does that, then the theory is wrong. Simple as that. It is wrong. There is not going to be any temple. So I, for the benefit of, if the Lord does it, so be it. But it will have to take a miracle. And then you still have to re reintroduce the Levitical priesthood, which died, which is gone. You don't understand that. The priesthood is finished. Jesus Christ was the last high priest. There can be no other. And Jesus' body was even taken outside the camp, taken outside the city wall, and, um, and crucified, hung up the nail, and he was buried. And it's him. He is the one, the very person who became the high priest, and then the high priest himself is sacrificed for our sin. And he knows us. And he knows that we need salvation. He knows we can't do it by ourselves. Doesn't that give you, in a sense, it gives you a fair in a sense of your own corruptness and your own sins, but it also gives you a comfort that when you genuinely struggle with sin, genuinely, and you, he knows whether you are truly guilty or whether you truly are within saying, I do not want this. He knows. You can't hide nothing from it. Doesn't that add a little bit more when he says... Don't, you, know, you don't need to rattle on big fancy prayers and big ceremonial prayers because he knows already what you're going to ask. He knows everything about us. People get you wrong. He doesn't. And it's him whom we are opened up to in the eyes of him. The eyes of him. Now, when we talk about this, to whom we must give an account, we're on to verse 13. Hebrews 4.13. And open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. I don't think the translation is particularly clear here. Because this, this is communicating something. It's communicating two things here. And I, I remain a little bit puzzled on, on what the original author was intending to communicate. Because he says, with whom we have to do. That's what this translation says. But in the Greek, at the, the, last, word, the last word here is, is logos, theos. Uh, logos, not theos. Logos is in the Greek at the end, which is the same word for word. Now, I don't know why that's in at the end, and I don't know why the translations never communicate it, but they try and communicate it into a flow of language to say that all things are naked and open unto him with whom we have to do, with whom we must give an account. 
Most translations say, to whom we must give an account. King James uses this old, old English term, we, t- with whom we have to do, we have much to do with him. It means the accountability. But the one translation in 1388, William, uh, John Wycliffe's translation, which was the first English translation of the New Testament, says, he, impl- he puts this, to whom a word to us, and I can't figure out what he meant by that. But he saw that this word needed to be in there. And he, he put it in. But we will all give an account to Jesus Christ. On the day of judgment. We will all give an account to Jesus Christ. Make no mistake about it. We're not just going to go up to him and, and forever, you know, just, just go up and that's it, you're in. And get to the pearly gates and you're already in. You're going to give an account. You are going to stand for the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. And in case you think I'm talking heresy, I'm not. 2 Corinthians 5.11 uh, 2 Corinthians 5.10 Sorry 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive things done in his body according to what he hath done whether it be good or bad He's speaking to believers and even possibly unbelievers there now some translations say we, we must all we will all stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. There is none of that in the Greek. We won't stand. Certainly the unrighteous will not stand. It says in Psalm Psalm one, the the, the sinner will not stand in the judgment. He won't stand there, he won't even get it, won't, even, won't stand there at all. He'll just be crumbled. Utterly crumbled before him. And that's why I think the King the King James does well here, because it says we must all appear. Appear is, is, is good, I think, mm-hmm. before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. And that is essentially where we, we are going. Nothing's going to be hidden from him. Nothing is hidden from him. Verse 14, and we'll conclude on this verse. Verse 14, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. So here we've moved from the theme again, and we're moving up to the superiority of Christ, formally declared over Joshua and Moses and the law and, and even the high priest. And now, in this theme, and I want you to remember this, this theme for the, for the continuation, he now points to him to being superior to, to, um, to Aaron. And the reason I say that is because he talks about him being from the line of Melchizedek, which we're going we're to come to, but he... He introduces Aaron in verse 4 of, the, of, chap, of chapter 5. If you look at Hebrews 5 and 4. And no man taketh this honour unto himself, but he that is called God was of Aaron. He introduces Aaron into it. And the argument here is continuous. So it's continuing on with that same theme. So he gives the readers a, a faith-affirming thing here. Because when he says, we, seeing then that we have this great high priest, a great high priest... Not only a high priest, the great one, who has passed into the heavens. Passed into the heavens. Now he's talking here, superior to Moses, the one who creation is subject to. This very same person who became the high priest... This very same person, think about this, the very same person who was born of a miraculous virgin birth, something that is impossible with man, absolutely impossible. A virgin birth. Then he lives a sinless life. And then this person begins to raise the dead and heal the sick and give sight to the blind and new ears to the deaf. Raising the people up from the dead. And then this person claims to be the great I am. He claims to be before Abraham. Claims to be the great I am. He stands before his trial and they say, Are you the Messiah? And he says, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man and the powers of the glories of heaven. This same person is then crucified. That high priest tore his robe, disqualified himself. He tore his robe in front of Jesus. And then 
They say, we have no need of witnesses. This is blasphemy. And then they say, they say, crucify him, crucify him. They take him on trial. He's innocent. He wasn't guilty. They take him on trial. Then they crucify him. And then they take him out. Then, then the soldier rams a spear into his side. In the meantime, they've beaten him. They've flogged him. Like they did, like the high priest had to do with the sacrifice. Flog the flesh. He wasn't just crucified. He wasn't just beaten like you see a few scars on him. He was marred beyond any. You would not recognize him as being a human being if you saw him the way he was, the way they were to him. When they flogged him and beat him and they punched him, they put a crown of thorns in his head. And then not enough. Then they crucify him. They stuck the nails through his feet and his hands. And then ultimately they take the spear and whether they thrust it, they thrust it into his side. If that went up from the rock soldier, and it was on his right side, it went up into the heart and pierced his heart, and then the blood flowed and it sprinkled like the sacrifice had to do. And you think about this this person is crucified like this, and then he's buried, and they see him dead, they certify him dead. There is no pulse, he's dead. Then this person raises himself from the dead. And he is seen for a period of 40 days. And then this person ascends into heaven. Like he says here, we have a high priest who has passed into the heavens. He's ascended into the heavens. I, I, I really don't know about you, but if I met a, a, a person who I saw, saw heal people, Raise the dead, cure people, and you knew this was factual. You knew this was factual, and you were a witness to this. And then you saw him crucified. You saw him dead. You saw his body in the tomb, wrapped up. And then he becomes alive again. And suddenly, before you, he goes up into heaven, right before you. He ascends into heaven in the flesh. He didn't just go in a spirit form. It was bodily resurrection. It was a bodily ascension. He's lifted up and taken into heaven. It's, it's completely miraculous. His whole life was miraculous. And this person, when he says, we have a great high priest who has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our profession. Here he gives us a faith-affirming thing. I'd just like to ask any of you, do you know any natural means by way that could happen? Is there any explanation that any human being can give to say how these things happened? How a man could be raised up? It's someone to put your absolute faith in. He's lifted up into the sky. And then not only that, we have this great high priest. And when he talks about him holding fast to this profession, this holding fast, when he says, we have, you can easily miss over those words, we have. Do you know what that means? It's from the Greek word, from echo. It means possession. Not only do you possess Jesus Christ, not only are you one with Jesus Christ, but he possesses you. This oneness is indescribable in the unity of it. You are one with Christ. You have him. That's what he's saying. <coughs> we have this profession. We have this great high priest. It's easy to miss over those words. It's speaking about the oneness. Still look at one, one, 1 Corinthians 6, 17. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. Paul, Paul describes this oneness. He gives, he gives the end of it anyway. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. One. And not only that, not only are you one with Jesus Christ, but you are one with the body of Christ. You're a true believer. 
And you're not marred by unbelief. Because that's the only thing that can prevent us now. Unbelief. Look at Romans 12 and 5. Romans 12 and 5. So, we, being many, are one body in Christ. And every one members one of another. He's talking here, even the body of Christ is one with him. We have him. This is possession. This is ownership. And he passed through the heavens. That's talking about the ascension of Jesus on the Mount of Olives. That's where it happened. You can read about that if you look. Read it through uh, Luke's Gospel, Acts of the Apostles and Mark and so on. And it's confessed right the way through the history of the Christian church. Right through, through the creeds. The ascension is such an important thing. The point here is that according to the old covenant, the high priest had to pass through three places. The outer court of the temple, the holy place, and the holy of holies. Jesus passed through the true meaning of all of them into the third heaven. He passed through them all. And he accomplished salvation. He accomplished redemption for those who believe. It's accomplished because the atonement, according to the Levitical law, had only was possible to be applied to those who confessed their sins. Even though that atonement was made for all of them, if they didn't confess their sins, the atonement was not for them. It wasn't to be applied. It was available for them all. And likewise, all those whom God has chosen in the Gentiles, all the Gentiles are chosen before God. And it's available for them. That's why he says it's available for all. Christ is the saviour of all. That's why it says he loved the world. Because he's not talking about only the elect. He's talking about all the Gentiles. Regardless of who you are, Jew or Gentile. All of those who believe in Jesus Christ and confess their sins before him. He has accomplished redemption for those who believe. And then, this is another, another word that he uses here to finish this off. He uses these words, let us. Let us. And you'll find that in, in, in verse 1 of the same chapter. Let us therefore fear. And then in verse 11 of the same chapter, let us labor. And then in this one he says, let us hold fast. Let us, this is plural. This is not just your salvation. It's not just a singular thing. This is for all of us. Let us hold fast to this profession. This idea of holding fast is to keep hold of this. Don't let go of it. Don't let your sins and your worldliness consume you and take you away from the scriptures, take you away and attempt to take you away from God. If I confess that is possible. I don't know whether it's possible or not. All I know is what the scriptures tell me. But let us hold fast to this profession. Because we have this grounded not only in hope, we now have this grounded in expectation. Make no mistake about it, it's not, comp- it's not all finished yet. He's still got to accomplish more yet. You know why? Because he hasn't yet returned. And just as they saw him ascend up to, into heaven, he says, to the, Don't you think it's funny when, they, when you read that, when they say, um, this, the angel comes and says, People, why, why are you standing? Amazed as though that you know that when when they saw him ascend, why why you stand gazing into the sky? As you saw him go, so you will see him come back. And that describes why are you standing amazed in this? Why are you looking as though it's not going to be accomplished, as though it's impossible for this to be accomplished? It's gonna happen, people. It's gonna happen. One day Jesus Christ is going to return. I might be in the ground before then. We all might be dead and gone. But either way, he's coming back. And he's coming back and that is it. When we are gone, from this life we are gone. We've got to hold on to this with everything we have. Everything that we have within us, we've got to hold on to this. And where we can't do it, because we are helpless creatures, we've got to call upon him because he's greater. Far greater. And he is able to save us. He is able to keep us out of our sin. You know, there'll be times. There'll be times on Judgment Day when you will be surprised 
to know what he has not let you go into. Because there's many sins all of us in this room could, if not for grace, and if not for him, could have been in already. He kept us out of them. It's because he has a miraculous hand that's with us all the time. Because if we belong to Christ, we are one with him. We're not separated from him. That's why Paul says it. Nothing in creation is able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.